how does our friend Cupid do it? Well, he dips that arrow in a lot of neurochemicals that evoke powerful, I gotta have it, signals in our mammalian brain. When we chase things in our lives, we're not after the things as much as the feelings associated with high dopamine. Dopamine is released in response to expectations rather than actual levels of pleasure. 64,000 is the median number of words per book. Average person reads about 200 words per minute. Simple math will tell us that is one book in 320 minutes. To accomplish this in seven days, numbers say you would have to read for 45 minutes a day. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, comment, and share. Enjoy. Welcome to the Book of the Week series. Every week, as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. My name is Igor S.F. Walker. Today, we look at Cupid's Poison Arrow, from Habit to Harmony in Sexual Relationships, by Marina Robinson and Douglas Weil, Ph.D., so how about you slow down and relax? Reduce all that noise for just a bit. Make that choice and decide to listen. In this video, we visit our mammalian mating and bonding programs, which are like two pedals that drive our intimate relationships. Habituation pedal and harmony pedal. As pair bonding mammals, we are programmed for both reproductive urges, mating, and a desire for physical and emotional closeness, bonding. The ecstatic exchanges are a way to move beyond the habit of using sex as a mood altering device that actually leads to satiety and focus on the comforts of harmony. Stick around till the end. I will share with you some tools I do have and use that will help you tremendously in this game of life. Discover a way to find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. I will share some tools to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management and relationship management. <clears throat> Sex, avarice, and violence are the three two-edged swords of human evolution. How to tame sex without destroying love. How to tame avarice without destroying creativity. And how to tame violence without destroying courage have been the preoccupation of religion, politics, and philosophy from time immemorial. Somehow, avarice and violence seem simple in comparison to sex. There are two fundamentally different ways of making love. One for fertilization, and then one for triggering closer bonding. Cariza. <coughs> when we fall in love, a primitive part of our brain pierces us with a desire for a great passion, Cupid's dart. Now an orgasm feels great, and if it were the end of the story, lovers would be able to do what comes naturally in the bedroom and then live happily ever after. The problem is that sex, especially the kind with lots of orgasms all around, leading to the feeling of, I'm definitely done, sexual satiety, isn't an isolated event. Orgasm is the peak of a much longer cycle of subsequent changes deep inside our brain. These lingering effects and the unwelcome feelings they do evoke can poison our relationship without our conscious awareness. Remarkably, such diverse symptoms as selfishness, unfulfilled needs, 
communication problems, infidelity, and sexless marriages can all originate in these hidden commands. Usually, when Cupid's poison curdles a romance, we conclude that we either chose the wrong mate, or that men and women are just hopelessly different, yet it is not our differences that cause this distress. It is what we actually have in common, involuntary biological responses that are as unconscious as blinking is. We are programmed for this painful unraveling just as surely as we are programmed to fall deliriously in love in the first place. For most mammals, frenzied mating to the point of disinterest is the signal to become restless and move on to another dance partner. Could our mammalian heritage have settled us with similar subconscious responses to sexual satiety, which also makes us restless. Are we wired to grow apart from a familiar mate, even though we're still programmed to seek the benefit of long-term companionship? More important, what can we do if we wish to protect our relationships from Cupid's poison? Could our mammalian brains be meddling with our capacity for sustaining intimate relationships? The mammalian brain lies beneath the rational brain. It governs, governs sex and love, and it is surprisingly similar in all mammals. Most mammals do not form pair bonds as stable as ours. Yet, even among our few monogamous mammalian cousins, no species is sexually exclusive. They borrow together, they co-parent, but they are frequently compelled to gather genes from strangers on the side. Those enterprising genes like to keep gene poles nice and fresh. Research confirms that as the duration of partnership increases, sexual desire declines in women, while desire for tenderness declines in men. Fertilization-driven sex is for procreation. Climax launches sperm to meet egg. In contrast, bonding-based sex has harmony and well-being as its primary objectives. Both methods entail intercourse to ease sexual tensions. Effectively, fertilization-driven sex achieves this goal with a neurochemical crash, followed by a surprisingly slow return to homeostasis that is pre-orgasm balance. Bonding-based sex eases sexual tension via gentle intercourse mingled with deep relaxation and a lot of soothing affection leading to refreshing feelings of satisfaction and then linger lingering equilibrium. Making love is like inflating a balloon. Having an orgasm is like popping the balloon. But if you finish without an orgasm, you are like a balloon that takes several days to gradually deflate, leaving you much longer to enjoy the inflated feeling. The technique is not based on control. During intercourse, you're not seeking to avoid orgasm or to manipulate your bodily energies. You're merely closing your eyes, feeling those energies streaming into your heart, your head, your genitals, and those of your lover, and then allowing them to circulate. You're always relaxing, relaxing, falling back into the heart. Effortless awareness is the key. <clears throat> All your energies will be drawn upward, diffused throughout the body. As this takes place, lustful tendencies will be transmuted into feelings of love, and the need for conventional orgasm 
will actually lessen. Sexual alchemy is only possible when the unstable male sexual energy, number one, is aroused without bursting out. Number two, welcomes the more stable yin energy. And number three, fuses with it. Many blame the Christian religion and its prescriptions about sex for today's unhealthy sexual attitudes, a point of view with some justification. Yet, as I continue to dig for clues, I learned that Cupid's poison arrow predated Christian influence. For example, 2,000 years ago, a Roman po poet Ovid cynically advised using the pursuit of orgasm to the point of disinterest is actually cure for love. <sighs> Loving means much more than sex. It means becoming comfortable with the whole wide gamut of both pleasant, unpleasant, sexy and not so sexy aspects of sharing life with a real human man or a woman. Once you've reached this point where you're not going to objectify each other, then it is almost impossible to step into conventional default roles of relating without immediately feeling sick. It was apparent that the fallout after orgasm led to clouded perception for both men and women. It was also clear that it often gave rise to uneasiness and anxiety, particularly between mates. Now, the good news was that making love without sexual satiety yielded a refreshing lightheartedness that increased with consistency. Those few people I knew who were willing to experiment felt better and more in control of their lives when they cut back on orgasm, even while on their own. Yet it was decidedly awkward to try to explain any of this to someone who hasn't already experienced the benefits. <clears throat> the Bermuda Triangle of Relationships because separation tends to creep into committed relationships in one of these three ways. Number one, the sexual attraction between partners fades. Number two, they become less available to each other sexually, even though there is still an attraction between them. Or number three, the couple's monogamous commitment breaks. With any of these three cornerstones removed, the relationship is usually badly crippled, even if it survives. As I looked around, I saw that even the best matches all too often found their way into the puzzling Bermuda Triangle, despite all the efforts to stay on course. The reasons for separation often appeared to be beyond their control, incompatible sleeping habits professional needs to live in different locations, snoring, children's demands, illness, inexplicable fatigue, sexual dysfunction, and so on. Many couples blamed their lack of libido on fatigue. But if they divorced, they found plenty of time for passionate romance. So suspicion arose that exhaustion might actually be one more way of un consciously avoiding the fallout from sexual satiety. No species of mammal is sexually monogamous, including humans. Multiple mates improve our genes, chances of making it into the future, urges, drives, emotions and moods equate with neurochemical changes occurring in the part of the brain common to all mammals. Dopamine, the craving Neurochemical stimulates the brain primitive reward circuitry. It drives us towards new mates and sexual satiety. The impersonal selection process of evolution tends to conserve behaviors that work, that is, behaviors that lead to the most genes flowing into the future in the form of progeny. Impulsive desire. I'm hot for you, baby. The romance obviously serves this end as well. So intoxicating honeymoon neurochemistry 
makes perfect sense. Yet, so does the less obvious behavior producing offspring with different mates. Experts had assumed that men and women had very different mating strategies. After all, women invest a lot of time and resources in each child. In theory, they should be choosier about mates. Men, on the other hand, can pass on the most genes by pollinating as many flowers as possible. Yet, it turned out that hunter-gatherer women are just as promiscuous as men. It's certainly to a male's genetic advantage to sow his seed far and wide. But a woman's genetic advantage lies in seeking a mate who looks like he has good genes and is a good provider with lots to invest into the offspring. Now, who says they have to be combined in one guy? <coughs> the mammalian brain is the control center for all the neurochemicals that bond us to mates or lead us to heartache and separation. The same neurochemical can affect body and mind differently. Dopamine is the prime gut fly that activates your reward circuitry, where it equates with eager anticipation. A little bit of dopamine activating the right nerve cells makes life seem worth getting up for in the morning too much. And you may bounce around like a popcorn too little, and you may sink into apathy instead. Dopamine itself is what motivates you. You're not craving ice cream or sex with that film star. You don't even win the lottery or bungee jump. You're actually seeking more stimulation of your reward circuitry. The bigger the surge of dopamine in response to some activity or a person, the greater your perception of satisfaction. Orgasms and potentially new mates are compelling, largely because of the dopamine released in our reward circuitry. Orgasm sets in motion a cascade of programmed neurochemical events which may continue for approximately two weeks. They change how we feel and how we perceive the world around us, especially in a mate. They can speed up habituation. Changed feelings may be subtle and can take many forms such as irritability, cravings for more orgasm, fuzzy thinking, emotional neediness, overreactions, and fatigue. As the mammalian brain triggers habituation, the rational brain generates rationalizations for incompatibility. The passion cycle can activate the amygdala's stress response, causing us to misperceive a partner as a threat. While you are declaring your undying love as orgasm approaches, your body is preparing to play a nasty trick on you. The very intensity of your glorious crescendo will trigger a cascade of neurochemical events that have the power to shift your perception without your awareness. These neurochemical shifts can affect your judgment and how you experience the world. Above all, they can easily tarnish the way you see your lover and then create emotional distance between you. Male or female, it may be two weeks before you are completely free of their effects. This is the two-week passion cycle or orgasm cycle. When sensitivity to dopamine drops, we may feel flat, apathic, dissatisfied, fatigued, or even irritable, and especially susceptible to substances and activities that promise quick relief. Dopamine fluctuations can cause mood swings and perception shifts. Even when subtle, they can make intimacy bewildering. We may be looking at each other through rose-tinted glasses one day and long, dark tunnels the very next. 
How we make love definitely influences our mood and our perceptions of each other. Attempts to address the symptoms of these, this built-in separation mechanism with communication skills, with therapy, negotiation skills, or artificially enhanced passion often do get results, but they do not address its biological source. We humans will continue to get the same results on average, as long as our willy genes do call the shots. Our environment has dramatically changed, but our reward circuitry and our mammalian brain have lagged behind. The capacity to binge on food and sex evolved when sugary foods and sexual opportunities were scarce. Now. We face an array of super stimuli, which tamper with our reward circuitry, leading to withdrawal symptoms, cravings for more stimuli, and sometimes even more permanent brain changes. Low dopamine is behind withdrawal symptoms, but it spikes when we do see a cue we associate with relief. Intense cravings and often compulsions can result they make the return to equilibrium very challenging. We have lost many of the rewards of close companionship that our ancestors enjoyed, which make us more susceptible to overindulging addictions and compulsions. We could not fall in love without changes in a specific part of our mammalian brain's reward circuitry. This reward mechanism is not gender specific. It evolved to bond us to our parents and to our children. It does not operate on words or logic, but rather on specific, frequent behaviors. Now we can use these behaviors at any age to strengthen emotional bonds and keep them strong as we drift away from them. Those bonds weaken. Carissa is relaxed, gentle sex. It is a simple approach if couples move toward it gradually with a lot of generous bonding behaviors. Carissa apparently activates the body's relaxation response more than the orgasmic sex does. Perhaps you learned in school that your nervous system has two fundamental responses to stimuli, parasympathetic and sympathetic. Comforting stimuli activates the parasympathetic nerves, allowing your system to focus on regeneration, digestion, healing, sexual arousal, and general housekeeping carissa. With its emphasis on relaxed, non-goal-oriented affection, seems to rely heavily on activating these nerves. In successful carissa, the sex organs become quiet, satisfied, demagnetized, as perfectly as by the orgasm, while the rest of the body of each partner glows with the wonderful vigor and conscious joy tending to irradiate the whole being with the romantic love, and always with an afterfeeling of health, purity, and well-being. We are most happy and good-humored as after a full meal. Now, oxytocin is the primary neurochemical that enables us to bond with others. Emotional bonds require both oxycodone and dopamine to stay strong. Orgasm cues dopamine to fluctuate in the reward circuitry, which then can destabilize bonds. Bonding behavior is proactive, it's healthy, because they counter the effect of stress. Fights with the loved one can put the amygdala, or our inner guardian, on alert, which then erodes bonds. Bonding behaviors, oxycodone, calm the amygdala. Your body delivers chemicals in just the right amount, precisely to the places where they are needed for as long as they are needed, and then quickly disposes of them. A shotgun approach can cause unintended consequences and then alter the brain itself, as we humans have lost the rewarding companionship that is the preferred mood medicine for our mammalian brains. Compulsions 
have increased. Oxycotin producing behaviors ease these compulsions. <clears throat> we can use Carissa to meet our longing for a paired bond, soothe sexual frustration, counter habituation, and then compensate for our missing tribal companionship, even without the cooperation of a mate. You can observe the orgasm cycle in yourself. Inflamed libido is not due to a physical surplus in the body. It is often due to the oversensitivity to stimulating cues. Consciously, the sufferer may actually be seeking relief from these withdrawal symptoms and the comfort of a pair bond. Carissa makes it easier to forgive others and to oneself for past relationship craziness. It also increases optimism. Carissa is based on relaxation and generous bonding behavior. It does not call for either suppression of orgasm or demanding sexual performance. Carissa heightens sensitivity to subtle pleasures. So, life and gentle intercourse both become increasingly pleasurable. With bonding-based lovemaking, the focus is on comfort, not hunger. Instead of diving in and swimming towards each other like barracudas, lovers hold hands and then stroll leisurely into the ocean together. They allow the reward of deep connection to ease sexual tension. Spiritually, Carissa's lesson is clear. It makes a great deal of sense to attain the most exalted state of happiness and fulfillment. It is necessary to help someone else get there too, said Bernard Jansen, MD, author of The Love, Sex and Nutrition. And there you have it, Cupid's poison arrow from habit to harmony in sexual relationships. Now please do help out, it is easy, simply like this video so more people can enjoy it. Share it too and do spread the word, leave a comment and share your thoughts. Subscribe to my channel and stay up to date and the link to this book is in the description below. So buy it and read and never stop learning, especially learning about yourself and nature. So gift yourself by taking the free human needs test on my website and then find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. And if you feel you are ready to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management and relationship management even further, do check out my Master of Life Awareness program. The links are in the description below. Thank you. Love and respect.